stations, action stations. Ship's company and brace for shock. We have a casualty in the forward foam room. I looked at the chart. He was very much in what are known as the pirate infested waters. A powerful task group of warships has sailed east from home ports in Canada to one of the most lawless maritime regions in the world, the Persian Gulf. Now in command of Combined Task Force 150, its mission is to lead an international coalition of warships in the fight against maritime terrorism and piracy using whatever means necessary. Deployed to this dangerous theater of operations on active duty for four months, these are the men and women who make up the crew of Her Majesty's Canadian ships, Iroquois. Walk her in, guys! Calgary. And Protector. HMCS Protector is an auxiliary oil replenisher, or AOR. Her role in this mission is to provide food, fuel, and supplies for the warships in the international fleet. At 24,700 tons, she was built to be a warehouse at sea, sailing through the theater of operations with her ship's crew performing two and sometimes three razes or replenishments at sea daily. Prearranged mid-sea rendezvous with coalition warships extends their operational capabilities. Without having to lose precious time returning to port, these ships can remain on patrol in the search for terrorists for weeks at a time. A goal of Combined Task Force 150 is the development of a recognized maritime picture. Simply put, it's knowing who's out there and what cargo they're carrying. The primary role of HMCS Protector is to replenish the Coalition warships, but here in the pirate-infested waters off the coast of war-torn Somalia, the ship's company is fully prepared to do much more than that. It remains alert for any signs of drugs, weapons, and human smuggling. When a suspicious vessel is spotted, there's only one way to determine whether its cargo is legal. Commander Yves Germain is the executive officer aboard HMCS Protector. came across a vessel uh, this morning, first light, that we saw that uh, was in distress. They were waving a red flag and stating that they needed to communicate with us. So right away we decided to send our boarding party uh, doing uh, an approach operation, which is uh, consisting of sending a boat with our naval boarding party and assessing uh, with the translator and bark, assessing uh, their, uh, their need or their assistance. A distressed fishing boat could be just that. But in this part of the world, things aren't always as they seem. This distressed dhow could be carrying a cache of illegal drugs, or worse, it could be a terrorist decoy, waiting to lure coalition forces into a suicide bomb attack. The boarding party team assembles in the dispersal area for a briefing. Lieutenant Jay Turner is the boarding party team leader, or Alpha One. We have a uh, drifting Dow not responding to VHF hails. Right now they're flag, flying a red flag, which uh, generally indicates some distress, all right? They've been drifting for a while, we've been observing them. Our primary mission will be to determine the nature of their distress, see if we can uh, initially assist them, and then carry on gathering any information we can about that Dow in standard procedures for approach ops. Up. Signs indicate a low threat operation, but when a vessel of interest or VOI doesn't answer a hail from a warship, the boarding party isn't about to assume anything. 
speeding across the water at 30 knots, the boarding party can be alongside the fishing boat in less than two minutes. The ribs coxswain maintains a safe distance as the interpreter makes contact with the dhow. He announces the team's intention to board, appealing to the ship's master for cooperation. Protector's commanding officer surveys the operation from the replenisher's bridge. When we started towards the boat, but it just, it, it doesn't quite look right. I looked at the chart, I looked at the major shipping routes. He was very much in what are known as the pirate infested waters. And I turned to the boarding officer and said, you're gonna do an approach op here, but be very prepared to go into a rescue because his, his boat is drifting, it's not underway, and it's not in a part of the ocean where it looked like he was fishing or anything like that. The boarding party must quickly evaluate the threat levels and determine just what is happening on the fishing boat. While they weigh the information they've received from the Dow's captain, an unexpected fog patch blankets the area. A fast decision is made. The party boards the Dow. Trained in controlling potentially violent situations with the use of escalating aggression, the members first strive to keep the atmosphere calm and cooperative. So far, there have been no objections to inspecting the Dow's cargo hold. If there is a stash of drugs or bombs on board, it will probably be found here. The cargo is verified, and nothing suspicious is found. It becomes obvious that the Dow Somali crew is in need of assistance. As the scorching sun burns up the fog patch, the approach operation officially turns into a rescue operation. The Dow's parched crew is given much needed bottled water and fruit. As soon as they got there, it became apparent that the Dow had been uh, drifting for four days. Uh, they were requiring mechanical assistance, their engine uh, had failed, uh, their transmission had failed, and they required assistance to repair the transmission or a tow uh, back to port. The Naval Boarding Party team is a carefully balanced selection of sailors who possess a wide variety of knowledge and experience. They're prepared to react to almost any scenario. Protector is obligated by international law to provide humanitarian aid to those in need. A sailor with medical training tends to the injured Somali, while others inspect the engine. The situation now stabilized and under control, the rib returns to the mothership to pick up more medics. Alpha-1 moves on to the boarding party's second mission, to gather human intelligence on potential piracy. This information will be relayed back to the task force to contribute to a recognized maritime picture. Have you been, uh, have you been doing this a long time? Transporting uh, cargo, fish cargo? Yes. Like how long? Yes. Four years. Four years. We're just trying to uh, provide, uh, you know, a secure environment for you to do your business, etc. Yeah. Is uh, has he been? Uh, so he doesn't. He said he doesn't fish at all. You don't fish at all. He said, yeah, I don't fishing, but I, I buy from Bosas and I sell to Bosas. The Dow's master has been using a common shipping route between Bosaso in Somalia and Makala in Yemen. It's also a familiar route used by pirates. Sometimes their cargo is human. People attempting to enter Yemen illegally, hoping for any work in this poverty-stricken part of Africa. The naval boarding party will be alert for any signs of human trafficking. And the fish is uh, popular in Yemen, and that's why you uh, transport it to Yemen? Yemen yes. Does he ever have uh, trouble, like in Yemen, offloading his cargo, or he's been doing it long enough, it's smooth? No, it's good. He say, just I go over there and I sell my beef and I come back. He say. And is this, is this the uh, usual crew that he uses? Like these are friends or? Uh, he say mostly they change, uh, they change their schedule. Some, do, some of them they go to their family, some of them they come over here. The rib returns for protector with the second wave of the boarding party. Alpha One informs the Dow's master that additional members will be coming on board. 
Okay, so we're gonna bring we're gonna bring a couple more people on board. One of them's gonna be a medic to take care of your uh, sick guy. And then we're gonna have another guy come up, and he's gonna look in case we have to tow your ship. He's gonna make sure that we have somewhere to tow it. Okay. Establishing a positive rapport with the locals is crucial to the task force mission. Spreading the good news about the international goal to establish maritime security may encourage crews of other merchant vessels to cooperate with coalition members in the future. The team of medics assesses the extent of the Somali's injuries. It hurts him anywhere I touch on his spine. Okay. Can't we'll feel anything in his feet. Okay. Uh, limited okay. feeling in his uh, legs. Okay. His uh, blood pressure in that spine. And he has malaria. Mother, this is uh, Alpha One, over. Alpha One maintains control of the Dow while remaining in constant communication with the mothership. Both Commander Cantillon and Executive Officer Germain are kept apprised of the situation so they can effectively make decisions as the scenario evolves. Mother, this is uh, Alpha One, uh, the uh, engineering crew are on board assessing uh, the engine situation as well as the uh, Papa Alpha on board uh, assessing the, uh, the uh, casualty over. Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Beely now. Now aboard the distressed Dow, the medics discover that in addition to his injuries, the Somali Mariner is also suffering from malaria. A high alert situation has within moments become a rescue mission stench of an old fishing boat in the ruthless 40-degree heat and the persistent, unsteady rocking of the drifting dow can upset the strongest of stomachs. For the naval boarding party, seasickness is sometimes part of the job. Yeah, good time. I'm all right right now, but... What's that? No, I'm good for water. The uh, sea state's killing me. I'm a little bit uh, seasick. I may uh, blow chunks soon, but... In this type of situation, nausea can be a dangerous distraction. Alpha One does his best to overcome his discomfort and remain alert. With additional backup now on board, he transfers to the rib to deliver his next status report. What's that? Yeah, I'm not going anywhere. I'll just stand off. I'm just going to sit down for a bit. Mother, this is Alpha One. It looks like it's uh, problems with their transmission and the uh, only way to repair it would be to pull the transmission out. Uh, this would be a uh, significant repair in the assessment of the engineers we have, uh, indicating that towing is uh, looks like our uh, option over. Looks like we're gonna bring the vessel under tow. Seal still wants us to continue to progress whatever work you can. Uh, with the way ahead, don't pull the tranny, or is that the only option? Yeah. That's where we're at. That's where we're at. Okay, I'll pass that back, but we're going to bring it under tow, so uh, we'll just stand by uh, while they set up for that, okay? Mother, this is uh, Alpha 1. Uh, further conversation with the uh, Alpha 4 has indicated that the only option right now is to pull the transmission, and uh, that's their way ahead. Over. From Alpha One's perspective, the decision to tow seems obvious, but diverting a warship, along with its 260 personnel on board, is an expensive and time-consuming proposition. The commanding officer must be very thorough in his evaluation before a final decision is made to dedicate his resources to a towing operation. Yeah, can you give me a rough estimate, like super guesstimate, as to what it would take to pull the transmission? 12 hours. 12 hours. Mother, this is uh, Alpha One, uh, the uh, ETR, uh, just to uh, repair the transmission, uh, barring the fact that we don't actually have the parts on board, would be approximately 12 hours. Uh, but the Alpha Four is indicated due to the make and model of the transmission uh, that we don't have the uh, required parts on board. Over. Alpha One reboards the Dow to pass on the command from the bridge. Protector will indeed be towing the Dow to the nearest port.
Mother, uh, this is uh, Alpha One. We're uh, ready to receive uh, for towing over. Everyone has moved to the Dow's stern for shelter from the sun. Members of the Naval Boarding Party have been selected for their ability to evaluate situations realistically. In this case, Alpha One realizes he has reached his physical limit. Yeah, I need to change out. Yeah, I just emptied out, so. A blue tarp is erected by the boarding party to protect the injured Somali. A team of bosons arrives to prepare the dhow for towing. The nearest port is 130 kilometers away in Bosaso, Somalia, a country with a failed government. Circumstances that have allowed pirates to operate there largely unchecked. I think the best bet would be to uh, have these use the ribs to pull us over there. With the tow preparation underway and the situation well under control, Alpha One can take a much needed break. The extreme temperatures in the theater of operations can be dangerous to those used to cooler climates. I'll need, I'll need those life jackets on here. So because there's a potential that something bad could happen here, right? When we start towing this thing. Now within a few hundred yards of protector, the bosons on the dow attach a heavy duty rope or hawser to the bow. The decision is made by the combined task force to have the tanker tow the dow to the nearest warship, HMCS Iroquois. With her heavy armament and smaller size, Iroquois is better equipped to sail into the potentially treacherous port of Basasso in Puntland, Somalia. From the quarter deck, executive officer Yves Germain coordinates the tow. In Somalia, there is no regulatory body to determine a vessel's seaworthiness as one finds in Europe and North America. For this dhow, it looks like the pressure from the tow line alone could cause serious damage. The crew cautiously continues its work. This is a quarter deck. Uh, dhow is uh, responding uh, nicely. You can uh, slowly increase speed. Confirm uh, Tango Tango, you have you that? Quarter deck copy. And quarter deck, we now have two knots uh, run on. Copy, that was a city at the 190 yards this turn over. The boat appeared to be in a good seaworthy condition, uh, except for the engine. It appears they were maybe ferrying people from town to town in northern Somalia, since there, it appears that the road system is, is not very good. So they had departed a few days ago. We understood that uh, more than at least four days that they've been here at sea, uh, uncertain when they, they broke down. Uh, but they're going only 80 miles away from here, so we decided to give them a tow and uh, get them to their next uh, uh, port of call uh, in order to get them on their way. I think uh, we, we had a good response. Uh, uh, it, it always uh, takes a bit of time to, to get organized to make sure that the, uh, the vessel is capable of being towed. That's a serious concern for us. So we provided life jacket in case uh, the uh, the strain on the on the also would be too much, and uh, in case we damage uh, the boat. At this point, everything appear, appears to be uh, stable, and uh, we have quite a few more hours to tow this vessel in order to get them on. But towing is always a slow evolution, and it always takes time to uh, tow a vessel properly. Stress due to heat and dehydration happens quickly. During the tow, boarding party members and medics regularly change shifts about once an hour to make sure the team maintains its sharpness. But a shift change is no easy task. Strict protocol is practiced to prevent any unwanted contaminants from penetrating protectors' living quarters. Boarding party members begin by rinsing their boots. Their outer clothing is immediately removed to be washed, and they too must shower before being permitted to rejoin the ship's company. A four-hour tow in the punishing North African heat is a grueling seamanship evolution. But for all boarding party members involved, helping those in need is worth the effort. I'm very confident uh, the crew, through their actions, saved 14 people who had just had an unfortunate experience at sea. And in this part of the world, there's not a lot of coast guards, there's not aircraft doing patrols, which will get off the coast of Canada and the United States or Europe. So it really was a, a meaningful day to save the lives and there are just it was uh, 10 
fisherman and, and, uh, and five passengers that he was giving a ride to. Uh, and they just had very bad misfortune to have their engine, but then great fortune to have us come along and, and provide aid and tow them back to port. It's been a red letter day for the ship's company. The opportunity to provide humanitarian aid to the distressed Dow and his passengers has been a significant event and one that will be long remembered by the crew. Touring the theater of operations in one of the most lawless areas of the world is the mission for the Combined Task Force 150 warships, bringing maritime stability to the Persian Gulf region, much like a cop walking the beat in a potentially volatile neighborhood, can be dangerous. The boarding operation safely concluded. The supply technicians and protectors turn their attention back to their primary duty. These men and women perform hours of physical labor each day in extreme heat and humidity with average temperatures and humidex readings of between 40 and 50 degrees. Warrant Officer Dan Poirier is responsible for the 18 supply technicians in the logistics department. Okay, so this is where uh, the supply techs hang out. This is uh, six stores. This is a general area. It encompasses three different storerooms, 6, 9, and 11. Supply techs are basically the backbone of the Navy. Well, it would be disputable in many other trades, but we provide food, fuel, parts, ammunition. We're the ones that control it. We're the warehousemen. Uh, basically, in six stores is all the small commodities we store. Uh, protector has to be self-sufficient on its own, and we're also an auxiliary oiler replenisher, and we look after the fleet with fuel, food, we have worldwide cargo delivery. Uh, basically, for line items, we carry about 14,000 line items at a roughly a dollar value, uh, $150 million worth of stores on board. We can carry upwards of 100 tons of food and roughly 500 tons worth of cargo. Nine stores is located just below six stores. This is where Protector carries larger items that will hopefully see less use on this deployment. Okay, we're now at nine stores. This is our designated our air stores. Uh, when uh, Protector has the capability of embarking three helicopters. So in here, we, we uh, in their Vidmar cabinets, we store all the requirements for the uh, air deck. Um, basically now we're using it as a consolidation area. All our stores come down into nine stores, and as we do our receipts, we bring them back up to six to do our receipts. They've got eight triwalls there, or nine, ten triwalls of consumables that are from our offload project. And we also store CBRN equipment down here, and any packaging materials, and computer paper, photocopy paper for the entire ship's company. Also, we have our radiation locker over there for all our CBRN equipment. CBRN is Chemical, Biological, Radi Radiological, Nuclear Protection. Down here in 10 stores, we store a lot of uh, parts required to repair the ship's fitted equipment. All these parts down here are in support of our ship. Um, they're medium to large items, right? as of six stores with smaller items. The tanker is a, is, a, is a unique ship where we bring stores on for other ships and we generally store them in our warehouses. We use our space to the maximum ability. So sometimes we're, our, our warehouses are constantly changing shapes and, and where we store our location of items. Welcome to the lowest portion part of the ship. This is 11 stores. You're roughly about 40 feet below water. Right, there's a double keel, double hull, so on the other, about six inches after that, you're open ocean. 11 stores and all of our store rooms, uh, we like to affectionately call it depth central. We have an ammunition bag in front of us. We have fuel tanks on the port starboard side, fuel tanks on the port side, and fuel tanks aft. So we're, we basically work in the best part on board ship. We, that's why we like to call it Death Central. 
typically down here are some of our bigger items, stuff that doesn't move as frequently, pumps, motors, any large items. We store down in 11 stores, and it just uh, be best utilizes the space. Bring up all this stuff you can carry right now, and all myself and the other guys don't overload yourselves. We'll bring up the rest. We're gonna leave the weapons until the final time, okay? Sounds good. All right. After more than a month at sea, the ship's company is looking forward to two days in Dubai. But not everyone will be going into the historic city. Armed with a variety of weapons, some members will stay back to guard the tanker against any threat of terrorism while she's alongside. Ordinary seaman Kayla Chalk will be part of today's group. efficiency shoot to try to keep coming alongside and stay on your duty watch you must fire and prove that you are still capable of using a weapon. Okay, so get their actions all to the rear. Today's shoot begins with a careful cleaning of the C7 rifles. Similar to the M16 rifle, the C7s can be fired in either semi-automatic or automatic mode. Yeah, give them all a good light oiling right on the metal surfaces. Blowing up the mags, pre-firing, cleaning, just to make sure there's no other debris that got in the barrels from the last shoot. Um, we call the officer to watch. We get a range clear, so we'll be firing from our port side because we have nothing within 15 miles or less upon our ship right now. The proficiency shoot will take place on the tanker's largest and most open outdoor space, the flight deck. The group takes its weapons and waits for instructions for the semi-automatic shoot. Master Seaman Ian Biller will be leading today's proficiency test. The first shoot's going to consist of a five-round rapid. So when I tell you to, uh, when I say threat, I want to hear a verbal, stop, get back, okay? Stop where you are. Okay, when I say threat for the second time, I want you to come up on aim, cock your weapon, forward assist, and I want you to fire five rounds into the ocean. Everybody got that? The 10 round magazine load. quickly moves on to using the C7s in their more rapid fire automatic mode. Okay, make sure you got a good firm footing. Okay? okay just uh, stand behind them with your uh, hand there just in case they want to come back. You want to leave? On the line! Right! On safety! Wait for my line staff to come around and clear. Once you've been cleared, hit the blue catch, forward assist, try fire your weapon, close your dust cover. And place your weapon on the deck. Clear. Master Seaman Biller briefs the team for the next proficiency shoot, this time using 9mm pistols and targets. The 9mm is an important weapon in the arsenal used by those standing watch each time the tanker's alongside in an unfamiliar port. Today's extreme heat and humidity make it difficult simply to hold the firearm securely. Okay, these are pretty slippery because they're oiled and they're sweating a little bit, okay? I'll give you the load. You'll insert the magazine, give it a tap, put it in your holster. Okay, when you come up on in, I'll give you uh, drug and body armor, threat, you'll pull it out, Cock it. Drive fire. Everybody know what drug and body armor is? Okay, it's two to the chest, one to the head. So I'll say threat. You come up, cock it. Bang, bang, bang. Okay, come down off on in. 
Decock your weapon, holster it. Pretty easy. If you're in the middle of a firefight and you go and nothing happens, this is what we want to see. Grab your spare magazine, keep your weapon up. Because he probably doesn't see your slide to the rear. Once you have your other magazine and you inspect it in your hand, drop the other one out, put the other one in, hit the slide catch, and continue firing. Good. Checking their positions, the team readies for the drill. These weapons may be acclimatized to the 45 degree day, but the sailors are not. Handling the slippery 9mm is a challenge. On the line, red! Drop the body armor, red! Keep hold your weapon! Did I hit the target? Whenever you put your weapon in your bolster, always have your thumb on the hammer. Okay. The 9mm pistols are tricky to grasp under these weather conditions. To be prepared to stand guard when alongside in Dubai, the crew will have to have absolute control over their weapons, slippery hands or not. I can't get it back. I can't get it. There you go. Hold it. Rugged body armor! Seaman Chalk, firing a gun is a new experience, creating a certain measure of mixed emotions. I like it, it's fun. Um, hopefully I don't have to use it for the real measures that it's used for, but it's fun to shoot at the waves. <laughs> HMCS Protector's crucial role as a replenishment ship for the International Coalition's destroyers requires that she carry millions of dollars worth of stores. Her significance to the mission also makes her a potential target for terrorism. Now just south of Yemen, where the Gulf of Aden becomes the Arabian Sea, she's entered one of the most dangerous corners of the world. The ship's company must be ready to defend against potential aggressors. Protectors various departments train daily, but once a week, the entire ship participates simultaneously in a unique training exercise that unleashes real-time scenarios upon the crew at a moment's notice. It's called Battle Bag Training Day and it involves every member of the ship's company. <laughs> Lieutenant Jeff Kibble is the operations officer, or game master, for today's scenario. The way we run a training day is uh, the ship's company knows that Something is going to happen during that day, but they're other than the planners, uh, the organizers, uh, and the game master for the for the day. They don't really know uh, what is going to happen. So it could be anything. It could be a fire. It could be a flood. We could have a man overboard, uh, helicopter crash. Uh, so there's a whole host of things that could happen that, uh, that all the teams on the ship need to be prepared for. But they certainly didn't know uh, the specifics of when or what would happen in the scenario. The training session begins with a briefing in the operations room. Located just behind the bridge, the operations room is the first to receive communications and intelligence. Only personnel within this room will have full knowledge of today's combat scenario. Uh, Protector has returned to our uh, favorite uh, training area, the Straits of Molokai, and we're going to do. A, we're already starting a transit through the uh, Straits of Molokai, and we're heading to an important mission. Uh, the uh, Molokai Liberation Army has uh, vowed in the past to prevent warships transiting through what they claim to be uh, their straits. New reports uh, indicate that the MLA have acquired uh, some uh, ch uh, Charlie 802 uh, shore-launched uh, missiles, uh, potentially up to four. 
Task Force Intelligence has indicated that a new missile has fallen into the hands of terrorist organizations throughout Southeast Asia and the Middle East. It's a Chinese-built anti-ship missile C-802, or Charlie 802. Today, Protector's crew will train to prepare for an attack by a Charlie. The decision to use live ammunition during the drill has been made, but the CO has concerns. We've had uh, low detection, as you know, with the uh, Dows, only about six to seven miles on radar. Uh, so when we do the SeaWiz firings today, it's critical that we do an excellent visual lookout. That has, without a doubt, been one of our best sources for detection. I don't want any inadvertent firings uh, with a contact in the range that no one found because they relied too much on radar. So very good visual lookout for SeaWiz firings is required. The intention of Battle Bag Day is to put the ship's company under sudden and unexpected stress. Today's operations room officer, the ORO, has received new intelligence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, sir, we just got the tip for information that indicates that the Molokai Liberation Army uh, have declared intent to use missiles uh, to stop uh, all warships that uh, transiting their area, sir. I'm coming to air threat uh, warning uh, yellow uh, based on uh, tipper information, sir. Air threat warning yellow based on tipper from Mount MLA. Just ahead of the operations room and one deck up, the officers on the bridge are alert to the threat. Watch, uh, we have a missile site that's uh, being activated uh, to the uh, north. We are now at uh, air threat uh, warning uh, red. Watch or will bring the ship to action stations. The opportunity to identify just how a ship's company will measure up in the face of a highest alert situation is an invaluable experience. Despite the 40 degree temperatures, members scramble to get into full combat gear. Each battle bag day in this theater of operations is a reminder that the presence of danger is very real and very close. The officer of the watch, today's officer in charge of the bridge, looks out for the incoming missile along the bearing provided by the ORO down below in the ops room. Combat systems engineers, or CSEs, also take up their stations, readying protectors' missile defense systems. The surface weapons controller, or SWIC, tracks the incoming Charlie 802 missile with radar. Protectors' first line of defense against an incoming missile is the super rapid chaff launchers, located just below the forward sea wheels. The chaff fires cartridges that spread a small cloud of shredded aluminum, which distracts radar guided missiles from their target. Swick, chaff closed up. Swick, Roger. ORS, Swick. ORS, closed up. When approaching its target, the Charlie 802 missile dives to wave top height so as to inflict maximum damage. It uses a 165 kilogram semi armor piercing anti personnel blast warhead, which relies on the missile's sheer kinetic energy to pierce the hull and explode inside the ship. The CSE begins to count down the estimated time to impact. Pop up! No, zero, zero, 55 miles, separating from land. The identification of the incoming missile is confirmed. Hello. Roger, sir. ISS Charlie 802 by a speed and flight profile, intent taking all resolved missiles closing protector. With a single shot hit probability of 98%, it's one of the most difficult missiles to intercept. Flying at just five meters above the surface of the Gulf of Oman, it's reaching speeds just shy of Mach 1, over a thousand kilometers per hour. Vampire, zero, 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 45 miles, tracking south, speed very fast, has made 6009. Time is of the essence. In a real scenario, the slightest hesitation could have catastrophic results for HMCS protector and her crew. Launching chaff too early would have equally grave consequences. Confirmation, uh, missile inbound at 40 miles inbound. Roger, 40 miles inbound. Confirm bearing. 
Zero, zero, zero. Roger. On the port bow. The port bow. Missile inbound now 40 miles. Stand by. As the Charlie 802 missile rapidly approaches, the weapons engineer responsible for triggering the chaff anxiously awaits the order to launch. Empire, zero, 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 25 miles. Swick, you have a clearance to continue a chaff firing. The personnel are clear of the danger area. Swick, roger. With less than one minute to go before the C-802 strikes, the chaff rounds are launched. Vampire! Zero, zero, zero! Ten miles! Closing five! Nine miles! Action! Chaff in action! Starboard! Forward! Launcher! Chaff away! Eight miles! Roger, chaff away. Just off the coast of Somalia, Protector's crew prepares for the worst. With the C-802 missile hurtling towards Protector, the combat systems engineers have launched the radar countermeasures chaff round. But they don't wait to determine if the chaff has thrown the anti-ship missile off course. It's time to engage the last line of the ship's defense, the MK-15 Phalanx Close-In Weapon System, or SeaWids. This fearsome six-barrel machine gun is designed to engage anti-ship cruise missiles and fixed-wing aircraft at short range. Capable of firing 20-millimeter ammunition at 3,000 rounds per minute, one short burst of gunfire creates a deadly wall of tungsten bullets that can shred an incoming missile into scrap metal. Missile 5 miles. Roger, missile 5 miles. Should be Brace for shot range. Brace for shot range. I have the miss missile visual in the port bow now. Brace for shock and we're in the bridge. Missile visible. Ship's company is ready for shock. Missile down and command forward. Weapons free, 50 cal. Three miles! Missile visible. 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 Two miles! Carry bearing zero, zero, zero. Sea engaging. Sea was engaging. Ocelot, Sea was engaging. Fire, Sea was engaging. Sea was firing now. Assess kill. Roger, affirmative. We have good visual. There's shrapnel. Bits flying into the ocean about two miles off the port bow. Whiskey, uh, this is a Charlie Whiskey Assessor Protector Splash, to one Charlie 802. Break uh, air threat remains uh, red. Just go through your equipment everywhere, check, make sure that everything is still functioning. We're just doing a, a damage assessment on the bridge. No visual signals or signs of any uh, damage on the bridge or shrapnel. The Sea Whiz does its job, with the Charlie 802 missile just seconds away from Protector. But today's war game isn't over yet. Okay, all positions are oral. We just uh, took the uh, last uh, Charlie 802 with the uh, Sea Whiz. We are still being targeted by the Charlie 802 to the north. We'll remain on this uh, this course to take them. Oh, I've got a look at, we just got another report that there's uh, more tip information from ESM that we are continuing to be targeted. 502, that's your job to get down. Good work on the last one. Same work on this one. That is all. Okay. Outside the ops room, firefighters close up as news of a second anti-ship missile threat is piped through the ship. All the command commander. Indication of the missile in bottom of the port bottom of 35 minutes long, three minutes ago. And uh, came back, they said it was a false alarm. False alarm. Massey, let's see. Stand down the attack team. Roger. While the ops room and the bridge deal with the second missile attack, the firefighters are kept jumping 
as they're suddenly informed of a false alarm. Assuming there is no longer any danger from fire, they remove their gear. Ship's company has raised for shock. Brace for shock! On the ball, shock! Brace for shock! On the ball, see your feet! Your feet underneath your head off! That's right! Forward to it! Engage! Forward to it! Shoot! Firing. Ship's Committee on Brace. She was a kill. Rapid survey! Rapid survey! The second C 802 missile is intercepted before reaching protector, but the deadly storm of razor sharp metal shards of shrapnel, known as follow on, continues on a trajectory toward the ship. You can imagine a fairly large missile flying at the ship, and even though you shoot it, uh, all that mass continues and the rocket fuel and all that continues to fly towards the ship and uh, likely would impact the ship. So that's also a pretty realistic scenario to take damage even though you've uh, shot it down. Firefighters scramble to get their gear on quickly again to investigate the damage caused by the follow-on. Okay, first aider. Just so you're aware, we have a casualty in the forward foam room. All right? An injured sailor adds an unexpected element to this new scenario. The first aid team rushes to treat the casualty while firefighters are quickly briefed. Okay, guys. Fire's in the forward foam room. There's an attack hose rig right down the port side from this station. You are to go to this hose, use it, attack the fire. Right here. Ah! Injuries from shrapnel can be violent and brutally painful. Today's special effects are an unanticipated dose of realism. casualty is being treated, the firefighters approach the fire in the forward phone room. An infrared camera is used to look for any other injured sailors who may be hidden by the dense smoke. The firefighters cool down the door and allow the intense heat to dissipate from the phone room before rushing in with the water hose. The last disaster of Battle Bag Day has been met. Although satisfied with the exercise, Lieutenant Kibble, today's game master, has identified a few areas that will need to be tightened up in order for the ship's company to survive an attack. The reason we do it is to, to find areas of weakness or find uh, areas that need improving. So uh, overall, uh, I would assess that as a satisfactory uh, training evolution. The uh, closing up time was a little bit slow, could have been, could have been a bit better. The, uh, the alarm on the, the chaff uh, launcher uh, failed to operate, so the, they're going to investigate getting that repaired. Uh, there was a couple of communication difficulties, uh, reports uh, not being passed in a, as fast a manner as they should have been or, or were missed. But uh, overall, I, I would have assessed we would have uh, put the fires out, would have shot the missiles down, and uh, would have suffered some damage. But uh, yeah, the objective uh, was, was training. And, and to learn lessons, and I, I think those were learned, and they were shared, uh, shared by the teams to, all, to uh, everyone on the ship. It's uh, 35, 40 degrees out, so there's people that uh, don't look forward to putting on the, the uh, bunker gear and the, the, the firefighting gear. Uh, so, yeah, but in the, in the end, uh, everyone realizes the value of, of, of doing the training, for sure. As Battle Bag Day winds down, the exhausted crew members look relieved. 
their attention will now return to their primary mission. Confident that they have the ability to defend HMCS Protector and her cargo against any threat of terrorism, the ship's company sails on to the next rendezvous, fulfilling her role of international support for Combined Task Force 150 and the fight against terrorists and piracy on the high seas.